me tonight as we turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 81. We open up the good Word of God this evening. I've enjoyed today the fellowship with you and the time that we spent together in the Word and praying. And I hope that this message will be a blessing to you this evening. I believe that the Lord has laid up on my heart both of these messages we've preached this morning and tonight. He says here in Psalms chapter 81, we will begin reading in verse 8, and please notice every word. This chapter is dealing with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, or I could say God's people of the Old Testament. And he said in verse 8, he said, Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shall thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my God would not hearken, my people would not hearken, rather, unto my voice, and Israel would not, would none of me. He said in verse 12, So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsel. Now verse 12 is the verse we want to begin with this evening where God says in this passage, I gave them up. The title of our message this evening is When God Gives Up a People. Father, we ask this evening that you bless the time that you've given us together. We ask that your will to be done here in our lives. Lord, we pray for your anointing and blessing upon the reading of thy scripture. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of not only being saved and part of thy kingdom, but Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to live for thee and serve thee. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now notice with me as we come to verse 12 again, we would have to ask the question this evening, is it possible for God to give up a people? Is it possible for God to give up His own people? Well, this evening, I want to focus in on three areas. One, I want to begin and talk to you about nations that are given up. Secondly, I want to talk to you about churches that are given up. And thirdly, I want to talk to you about individuals that have been given up and even families. Now notice, first of all, as we come back here, I want to come to verse 8 again, in verse 8. And I want, uh, by the way, let me read verse 12 again. I want to make something very clear as we get started. And by the way, we find that in verse 12, the results of being given up. He said in verse 12, so I gave them up. Now let me say this, uh, as we come here and begin looking at this, we're talking about when we say God gives up someone, we're talking about God's judgment. But we find that the greatest of God's judgment is not necessarily being turned over to the enemy. Now, we're going to read some verses tonight where God gave up His people and they were turned over to His enemy. But there's something that I believe is maybe worse than being turned over to the enemy, and that is being turned over or being left alone, being left to our own selves. In other words, as a ship without a rudder, as a horse without a bridle, just being left to, our, uh, to ourselves. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I want you to underline this in your Bible. He said here in verse 12, he says, So I gave them up unto their heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. Again, we thought we're going to find cases where Israel was given up to their enemy. But I believe something that could be worse than given up to your enemy would be, number one, to be given up to your own heart's lust. In other words, to our own heart's desires, our covetousness, our idolatry, our materialism. Uh, that would be far worse than being handed over to the enemy by being given up to our own heart's lust. But secondly, I want you to notice, he said, and they walked in their own counsel. I believe that, in other words, when God says, okay, I'm just going to let you alone. You do your own thing. Uh, I believe that uh, here he's talking about giving up to their own counsels. He's talking about their own plans. Their 
their own devices. And so I believe that that would be a terrible judgment of God that He leaves somebody just walking around in the dark making their own decisions, following the desires of their heart. So there's more than just being turned over to the enemy. Now, as we begin looking down through this chapter before I turn away... I want you to notice again, these are the people of God in verse 8. He says, Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. I want you to notice with me in verse 11, he said, But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. In other words, we find that in the reason that God gave them up. What was the reason? The reason is simply that they would not listen to the Word of God. They would not heed uh, to the things of the Word of God. So we have in verse 12, we find them being given up by God Almighty. And you cannot love God and despise His Word at the same time. I've had people stand and say, well, I love God, but at the same time they're disobedient to the Word of God. That is a contradiction. But I want you to notice what they lost. The Bible says as we begin reading in verse 13, He said, All that My people had hearkened unto Me, and Israel had walked in My ways, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned My hand against their adversaries. Notice they would have had victory. He said, The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto Him, but their time should have endured forever. He should uh, have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied them. Notice by being given up, they were given, they had rejected first of all the Word of God, and then they were given up, they were given uh, up to their own heart's lust and their own counsels, that is, they made their own decisions in life, and then we find that here is the, uh, the consequences of being given up. We see that in verse 13 through 16, the wonderful things that they lost by being given up by God. Turn to Psalms 106. In Psalms 106, notice with me carefully, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 10 a story of the history of the nation of Israel as they came out of Egypt. Uh, you'll notice with me as we begin in verse uh, 10. He says here in verse 10, And He saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of their enemy. And the waters covered their enemies, and there was none, not one rather, of them left. Talking about the Red Sea and destroying the armies of Pharaoh. He said, Then, then believed they His words, and they sang His praise. Now notice they came to the Red Sea. God destroyed their enemy, and, and He opened the Red Sea and gave them a wonderful victory. He saved them. He delivered them out of Egypt. And, and the Bible says, and they praised Him and they sang. And then in verse 13, He says, and they soon forget His works and they waited not for His counsel. In other words, they went to their own counsel, their own heart's desire. But you've got to understand that you know what, you and I stand here and look at this and we can say, well, if I'd only seen the Red Sea, I would have never denied God again. But you and I do the same thing. We see God perform miracles. We see God do do great things, and then we're down in the mouth a few days later, a week later, a month later, and we're wondering whether God even exists and whatever. And we're the same way with an, as the nation of Israel. And as you read down through this chapter in verse 14, he said, "...but lusted exceeding in the wilderness, and tempted God in the desert. And He gave them their request, and sent leanness into their soul." In other words, God just went ahead and gave them what they wanted. And He gave them what they wanted, but He gave leanness in the soul. He turned them over to their heart's desire. He turned them over to their own counsel. He allowed them to make their own decisions and devise their own plans. And He left them alone for a period of time. And we find as you read down through here, they came to their end and had to cry out to God because they needed Him. Turn with me please to Second Chronicles in chapter 36. In Second Chronicles in chapter 36. Now I want to read some Verses whereby they were turned over to their enemy. You're taking notes this evening. Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 9. You'll find the story there, the invading Babylonian army 600 years before Christ. And uh, you'll see there in, in those chapters without any doubt 
uh, that God had uh, given up His people here in the Old Testament. Now, I want you to notice with me here as we come to this passage. Now, God can either turn you over to your enemy or God can just begin removing His hedge. You understand tonight that He has a hedge around this church. Uh, he has had a hedge around our nation uh, at times, and especially in the past. And, and God has a hedge around His families and, and uh, families um, that are children of God. And God has a hedge around the individuals. And all God has to do is start removing uh, this hedge. And we find that we get out from under the protective hand of God Almighty. Notice with me in Second Chronicles chapter 36. And I want to read in verse 16... And I want you to notice, you might want to underline this passage and make note of it. But he said in verse 16, he said, But they mocked the messengers of God and despised His words and misused His prophets. Now here is a, a sobering statement that is made. He said, Until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people. Now notice, till there was no remedy. I was showing a preacher friend of mine this verse not long ago. He said, I've never noticed that before. Because uh, I had made a statement. I said, they, God's wrath has came upon them until there was no remedy. And I said, this is going to happen to America. He said, where do you get that at? Well, right here he said that he said they mocked the messenger of God. I challenge you to read the entire chapter sometime. But he said they mocked the messenger of God. They despised His Word. They misused the prophets. And he said that the God's wrath has rose up against His people till there was no remedy. You know what he's saying? He's saying that God gave them up. He said, he said listen, no need to pray for Israel anymore. He said, I have given them up. He said, there is no remedy. It's over. They're going to Babylon on for 70 years. They're going to be punished for not obeying my Sabbath. They're going to be punished for rebelling against me. And as you read the rest of this chapter, you will find where the temple, the house of God is torn down. You'll find where the vessels of the house of God in verse 18 were, were taken captive and they're carried into Babylon. Later, they drank out of those uh, vessels, the king, and having their uh, drunken parties and so forth. You'll find where the house of God is burned. The walls of Jerusalem in verse 19 is torn down. The palaces are on fire. They destroyed everything. And you'll find that where that there's some that escaped by the edge of the sword, they were carried as servants in verse 20 to Babylon. You'll find that in verse 17 that they slew the young men with a sword. And, and it says here, and they had no compassion on the young men or the maidens or old men or him that stooped for age. The Bible says he gave them all into his hand. So without any doubt, we see the issue of a nation that was called God's people, that they were given up because they rebelled against God Almighty. Turn with me to Matthew in chapter 23. Now I'm going to give you some verses to jot down. And uh, we don't, we're not going to take the time to turn to all of these, but give you some verses to jot down. Now if you're taking notes tonight, in Matthew 15 and verse 14, the Bible talking about the Pharisees, the Lord Jesus. He said, He says, Let them alone. The blind shall lead the blind. You know what He means when He says, Let them alone? He said, There's no need to pray for them. He said, It's over. It's over for them. You'll find that in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 19, the Lord says, Let them alone. I believe He's talking about Ephraim there, the nation of Israel. He said, Let them alone. Acts chapter 7 and verse 42, God said He gave them up. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, God says He gave up the nations. There were nations that were given up. Why? Because they rebelled against God. So the only way to get back in favor with God, if it's national sins, then there has to be national repentance. If it's a church that sins, then there has to be a church repentance. If it's a family that is sinned, there has to be family repentance. If it's an individual that is sinned and has been given up, then there must be individual repentance to be restored again to the favor of God Almighty. Let me tell you a sad passage in the Bible. Uh, this morning, I was, by the way, I was going to preach on the ark of God, and the Lord led me in other directions. We'll do that in the weeks to come. I want to preach a message on the ark of God. The ark of God in the Old Testament 
Now, some of you have been watching television you, and you watch the, what is it, Raiders of the Lost Ark, so you don't really understand what the Bible really says about the ark. But anyway, uh, we, when we come to the Scriptures, that ark represented the presence of God Almighty. And the Israel was at war with the Philistines in 1 Samuel 4. And they came and stole, they took the ark. They took the ark away. And, and, and the Bible talks about a passage back there in verse 21 of 1 Samuel 4. Ahikibod, meaning the glory of God has left. In other words, the glory, think about this. It's a sad passage to me when I read that, that the glory of God had left Israel that day. In other words, God, in a sense of the word, gave them up. What about A.D. 70? God's people, the nation of Israel. Paul said in Thessalonians that the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 23. I want to read a few verses here if you're taking notes. Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. And then also in Luke 19, verse 41 through 44. We find there that the Lord describes how that Jerusalem will be compassed with the armies. This happened in A.D. 70. And he described what would take place. He gives detail about how they would be destroyed. He even says, uh, he even cries and weeps over Jerusalem. He said, if thou had only known thy peace. He said, but, but he said that God had visited them. And he said, thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he said, Jerusalem is going to fall. And they did fall by Titus and the Roman army in A.D. 70. Well, look at this. Here's a passage. Quite sad when you begin looking at this. He said, he said, I began reading in verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killeth the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen getteth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Now look at this. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And at this time, chapter 24 and verse 1, he walks out of the temple and begins describing the destruction of that temple. He said to Israel, your house is left unto you desolate. Left unto you desolate. So, does God give up nations without any doubt? He gives up nations, and the only way to be restored to that favor is through national repentance. Now, let's talk about churches. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. In the book of Revelation and in chapter 1. Now, I don't know. I, I believe God laid this on my heart to speak this evening. And I believe these are very serious warnings that we find in the Word of God. And I believe we live in some very serious times. I really do. With the church, with families, with our nation. Now, notice in Revelation chapter 1, now let's talk about does God give up churches? Well, we found out He gave up His own people. He gave up nation in the Old Testament. Does God give up churches, though? You know, there's churches. We're going to read about Ephesus in just a moment. Ephesus, the church there, does not exist today. It was founded by the Apostle Paul. When he writes to that church, he said, you were faithful in Ephesians chapter 1. When you come to the Scriptures, Acts 18 describes the founding of that church. In Acts chapter 19, we find that Paul preached there. He was there, I believe it was three whole years preaching there. And some wonderful and great things. As a matter of fact, Paul gave warning to the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, 17, uh, verse 17 and 18. He gives warning to that church there, and I believe they heeded that warning at that time. It was a great church. It doesn't exist today. And he told them what would happen to them if they did not get right. Notice with me as we come to the book of Revelation in chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading, notice with me in verse 4. He said in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from Him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before His throne. Notice he said this is written, written and he said to the seven churches which are in Asia. Notice with me as we come to verse 11. He said in verse 11, he said, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Uh, and he says, and what thou seest write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, 
Come down with me, please, in verse 19 and 20. He said, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven uh, candlesticks which thou sawest are the church, are, are the seven churches. Jesus stands among those seven churches in this chapter as you read the entire chapter. But we find as this book begins, he's talking about seven churches. He names them that were literal churches that exist in the day that John writes this letter. There are many today who say, well, those seven churches represent the time periods in the church. No, they were seven churches that literally existed during this time. Now, we can learn tremendous things from them. Each one of these churches, we can learn something very valuable from them. So let's look at two of them this evening. There's only two of them that did not receive any rebuke. So let's look at these. Does God or can God or will God give up churches? Notice with me, as we come here to Revelation chapter 2, I've been told the Metropolitan Tabernacle that Spurgeon used to preach in and thousands used to come to. I was read an article here a couple of years ago that says you're fortunate to find a hundred people in that church right at this present time. Right at this present time. Now, that is sad to me. That is sad to me. I, you know, I, I hate to hear. You know, I heard the other day about a preacher dying. And, and you'll hear about a preacher falling or, or whatever. You'll hear about a church closing up. And I don't know, that grieves my heart. I'm saddened when I hear that. Because I, you know, I, I've had people say, well, you are here in America, you've got churches on every corner. We need churches on every corner. You know, I figured up one time, and, uh, you know, I've heard that we need churches. You, you need churches. I figured up right here in Code Inn alone that, uh, that we have uh, uh, ten churches in Code Inn and there's 4,000 people that live in Code Inn. Do you know that with those ten churches and those 4,000 people, if everybody chose to go to church next Sunday, you couldn't get them in all the buildings? You couldn't get them in all the buildings. So you say, do we have too many churches? I don't think that we have too many churches. And Now, we've got too many bad churches. I mean, I'm including in that Catholic church and everything else when I say churches. So we've got some churches that are not preaching the gospel. But if you took all Americans and sent them to church next Sunday, there's no way the churches around the country can hold them, you see. And so it saddens me to hear about a church uh, folding up or, or, or getting to the place where they can't function, they can't support missionaries, and things of that nature. Revelation 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Notice this. He said, Under the church, uh, under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth uh, uh, the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now look, look at what he says good about this church. He says, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, uh, which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 3, and hath borne, uh, and, and hath patience uh, for my name's sake, uh, hath labored, and hast not fainted. When you scan down through these verses, again, this church is founded by Paul. I challenge you to read the book of Ephesians, a wonderful uh, doctrinal and practical book. He begins the letter by saying uh, to the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He gives them uh, wonderful truth. And as you get down into chapter 1, long 14, 15, 16, he, say, he talks about, he said, I've heard of your faith and your love. And he said, I cease not to pray for you. He said, I've heard of your love and your faith. They were a loving church in the beginning. They were a church that was filled with faith, good doctrine. If I were to describe the verses that we just read, as you look down through these first four verses, they were a hard-working church. They were steadfast in their beliefs. They were doctrinally sound. There was no compromise in this church. They did not tolerate false teachers whatsoever. They never gave up the battle for the truth. They stood for truth. And they never tolerated false teachings, but they had one problem that was bringing them to destruction. Please listen to me careful here tonight. He says in verse 5, verse 4, He said, Nevertheless, 
Imagine God coming and saying, now, brother, uh, boy, you've, you're faithful, you tithe, you pray, you're witness, but, but i got one thing I want to tell you that I don't like. He said in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You see, this is the first step downward. They lost their in. Enthusiasm. They lost that personal relationship with the Lord and one another. They lost that devotion that they should have. They lost that excitement. The honeymoon was over with the church at Ephesus. Now, he doesn't stop here, though. He says in verse 5, he said, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Fallen. Their doctrine was right. They had all of this. Their ducks were lined up. They were hard workers. They were serious about these truths. They would not tolerate false teachings. And he said, but thou art fallen. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. He tells this church that is doctrinally sound, that is hard working. He said, you need to repent. And he said, and do the first works, for else I will come to thee quickly and remove, notice thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaeans which I also hate. He said, you've got the truth. You've stood for the truth. You're sound in your faith. You have been in the battle. You have fought the battle. But he says, the honeymoon is over between you and the Lord. You have left your first love. Their compassion for the Lord Jesus Christ and their compassion for one another, that was fading away. And he said, you're fallen. So he sang to them, he said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. The Lord Jesus Christ stood among these candlesticks. He walked among these candlesticks. What is a candlestick? It's a light in a dark place. Every Christian is to be salt and light. Every church is to be a light in a dark place. And he's saying that if you don't repent, if you don't get this thing right, even though you're doctrinally sound, he said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to remove your light. I'm going to remove your influence and power in the world. You can dot every eye and cross every T and still yet miss the boat. If we now listen, if we lose our love, our devotion uh, for for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we lose that personal relationship, and by the way, as we begin losing that with the Lord, we will lose it with one another. We will lose it with one another. And he's saying, without any doubt, he's saying to this church at Ephesus. He said, listen, a letter in the Bible is written of them, six chapters, a great letter, a wonderful letter. He praises them for their love and for their faith and for their faithfulness. But he's saying, I will give you up. They no longer exist at this present time. They haven't existed for many, many years. He gave the church up because they had left their first love. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. The light will burn out if we're not careful. You want a good chapter on love? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think we ought to consider this thing of love when we, our words. I hear some in this church here critical of others. We need to be careful with how we treat one another and what we say to one another. You know what that's a sign of when we do the saints that away and a critical of them? That's a sign that we have lost something with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a sign. It is a sign. Well, let me show you another church that was in trouble that I believe that God gave them up as well. Notice women in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. Please bear with me. I must preach this tonight as I preach this morning. I believe this thing is so important. I want to survive as an individual. Don't you? You know, it, you know, I want, I want to, I want to finish this race. It is the, you know, I was watching these young men, and I don't believe I could have run full court. And uh, I think Brother Ron Beal found us; uh, they had trouble with it too. But I, I, I just, I quit running full court after about forty, turn forty-five. I don't believe I could do it. And but, but you know, I was watching this and, and them running full court. It's easy to run out of steam running full court. 
But let me tell you something. The Christian life is a marathon. There's people jump into this thing and they, they take off from the starting line, you know, just like a ball of fire and they take off. But you know what? They run out of gas down the road. I don't want to run out of gas. I pray every day, God, don't let me give up. Let me say as Paul, I finished my course. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I want that crown. I want to be able to cross the finish line out there one day. Some of these churches never cross the finish line. They fizzled out, dried up, and quit, and no longer existed. Hundreds of doors close every year in America of churches, and many of those fundamental churches. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 14. We're going to look at this passage, and then we're going to look at the individuals and the close. But notice this very carefully. By the way, what is the purpose of a church? Three-point outline. Evangelize sinners, edify the saints, and to exalt the Savior. There's three, three things. Now, Ernie... Well, that'll preach in another church. I'm preaching that here now. Don't y'all be preaching that here. I'm gonna preach that next month. But anyway, that's that is the three uh, that is the three uh, purposes for a church. You see. Now look at this. He said in verse 14, and under the angel, the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would. Thou were cold or hot. Now, as we... Well, verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Now, let me make some comments as we read it down through here. They had a form of godliness without the, and denying the power thereof. They were self-deceived. They were self-sufficient within themselves. And they were self-motivated. As we come to this church, look at this church, the Laodiceans had become lukewarm. They had become a casual Christianity. There was a mixture of hot and cold. They were in the middle of the road. Uh, they were divided between uh, Christ and the world. They were divided in their hearts and in their minds. Cold, hot, lukewarm. What does that mean? Cold. That which is frozen or that which is lifeless. Hot has the ideal of being zealous. Life. Life there. Activity. Full of life. But then we look at the word lukewarm. Nominal Christians in name only. They were lukewarm. There's nothing that tastes good lukewarm. Amen? People told me I'd get up and drink and milk at night. Hot milk. That'd make me puke, man. I don't know. I just... I, I'm, I'm telling you. I've... That milk has to be cold before I can drink it. Now, people say, well, I was sick and got up and drank good. Now, that not make me sick. But he says here, he said, I'd rather you be one or the other. He said, he said here, you, you've gotten lukewarm. And, and I want you to notice what he says of them. He says in these verses, as we read down through, he says in verse 16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, he said, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich. Now notice what, notice what they're saying. They're self-deceived. They're self-sufficient. They are self-motivated. They relied on their own efforts, their own programs, their own money, their own abilities, their own talents. Listen, if the Holy Spirit had walked away from the average church today, they would never know He left. I mean, they go on with their programs and whatever, and God could pack up His bags and leave, and the average church would never miss Him. And that's what happened here in Laodicea. And we find that here's what God told them. He said in verse, uh, uh, in verse uh, 17, Because thou saith, I am rich, and increased with good. Sound like America. He said, And have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. He said, I counsel thee to buy me of, uh, of gold, tried in the furnace, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And he said, And anoint thy eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. They had it all, but they had nothing. 
they had everything going. If you were to drive by that church, I mean, you know, in the modern day times, I mean, they would be blowing and going. The youth groups, the daycares, I mean, they got everything going, man, and, and just wide open and still yet God says, you're dead, you're blind, you're naked. And he said, he said in verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. And then he said this to the church. Now listen, he made, we use this verse in witnessing and there's nothing wrong with that. But he's talking to the church. The Lord loved this church of Laodicea. He loved the church at Ephesus and Sardis and Philadelphia. But here's what he said. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. He's standing at the door knocking to the church. He's on the outside. They're having church. And they will not let the Lord in. Because they've got everything going for themselves. God gave up the church to Laodicea to their own heart's desire and to their own lust. And later He removed the candlestick. He removed their influence in society. Turn with me please to 1 John chapter 5. Now I'm going to read in this passage. I've got about 30 more verses, but our time is running short. And, but I'm going to give you some verses. I'm going to give you at least eight or ten more verses. But I'm going to read this passage and I'm going to read one other and we're going to close this evening. I want to read in 1 John chapter 5 and I want to make a few points here out of this chapter. And I want to talk to you about three types of sin. Now notice in 1 John in chapter 5, we read from this chapter this morning, but we did not read the verses I want to finally get down to here this evening. Now, does God give up individuals or families? Yes, He does. Let me give you a few thoughts and a few verses before we read here in this passage. In Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 7, Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron the high priest, were destroyed. In Numbers chapter 16, Cory, family, and followers were destroyed. In Joshua 6 and 7, Achan and his family were destroyed because of their sin. In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira died physical death because of them lying to the Holy Ghost. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 30, 31, 32, along in that area where we read this morning and pertaining to the Lord's Supper, the, the Apostle Paul wrote unto them, he says, because of your, uh, your rebellion, and basically their problem was is the way they treated one another. The way they acted, they could come together and they did not treat one another right in the church uh, there at Carth. And so he says, some of you are sickly and some of you are dead. You're asleep. In other words, there were some of them that were sick and some of them were dead because they had not a love for the brethren in the church. This is serious business. God is not playing games, you see. And, and they were critical of each other. They were, they were not kind to each other. And when they had the fellowship meals together, they did not share with one another. In other words, there was the cliques in the church and all this kind of stuff. And we found that God was dealing with them. They were sick and dying because of this sin. And then in Jeremiah 22, 23 to 32, an entire family God dealt with because of one man's sin. And that family, he says, none of your seed shall sit upon the throne of David. Entire family. So God judges individuals and families. Now, does that mean He's going to turn you over to the enemy every time? Not necessarily. That means He may just take you as an individual and turn you over to your own heart's desire and your own counsel. In other words, you, you, if, if this is what you want, if this is what you want, then Lord just let you flounder around for a while and let you work out your own problems. I'm going to tell you something tonight. I don't want to be on my own. I can't. I, can't, I don't have the sense to turn the doorknob and walk out of this building without the Lord. I don't want to be on my own with raising my children or with my finances or with my health. I don't want to be on my own. I want His hedge around me. I want His hand underneath me. Notice with me as we come to this passage here. Now, watch carefully as we read these verses. We talked about prayer this morning for a little bit. He said in verse 16, If a man sees brother sin a sin which is not unto death, 
He shall ask, and He shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, there is a sin not unto death, and there is a sin unto death, and there is an unpardonable sin. Let's talk about three sins. Without turning to all the verses, I'll give you references. Now, what is a sin that is not unto death? 1 John 1, 9. That is a sin that's confessed. If we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us. So there is sins that are not unto death. That is confessed sins. But they are sins that are unto death. You say, Brother Reed, have you ever seen this played out in people's life? Yes, I have. Many, many times. In, we're talking about, will God give up an individual? Will God give up a family? I believe that the Lord will take a person's life, physical life, if he rebels again. This passage, by the way, he said, if any man see his brother, talking about a saved man, sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. If you see a man that's sinning a sin that's not unto death, you can pray for that man and God will lift that man up. But he said, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that, the, that he shall pray for him. There is that sin when a person rebels against God and said, no, hearkens not to his word. There will come a time in a person's life when God says, okay, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm taking you home. He said in verse 17, All unrighteousness sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Confess sin. But the sin, the rebellion against God, and I want you to keep in mind, this is the brother. This is not eternal death, this sin unto death. It is a physical death that he's talking about. When somebody continually and willfully rebels against God's Word, God will finally come to the conclusion and say, that's enough. When a man sins against the temple of God, his body is the temple of God, the church is the temple of God, and when a man sins enough, God will say, okay, that's it. Without remedy, it's over. Let him alone. No need to pray for him because I'm through. I'm through with him. Pray that that never happens. Pray that that never happens. Then there's another type of sin that is not committed by a Christian. Some believe it is. But it's the unpardonable sin. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30 and 32. It's committed by the lost only. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it's the comp final and complete rejection of Jesus Christ. All true repentance, by the way, is what? It's the result of the Holy Spirit, is it not? He, Jesus talked about this in John 15 and 16. And the Holy Spirit does a work in the heart of an individual. And so it is the Spirit that draws men to Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit uh, that, that draws them to saving faith in the Lord. What is the sin? of the unpardonable sin. Which was the final and rejection and complete rejection of Jesus Christ, guess what? When they blaspheme against God, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit say, okay, I will quit drawing Him. And you realize this evening that you cannot get saved if the Lord is not drawing you? That sin is only committed by the lost. There's a sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. And then there's the unpardonable sin. Only the lost can commit that sin. And an individual goes long enough and tells God no, long enough then, then the, if the Spirit of God ever quits drawing that individual, they cannot just... You don't just wake up one morning and say, well, I think I'll be saved today. God has to draw an individual before they can be saved. And that is the unpardonable sin that is mentioned there. Turn with me, please to the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. We'll close. In Proverbs, chapter 29. Now this sin that is against God, rebelling against God, you know what Paul prayed for? Paul prayed for in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, that he, he said, I'm going to bring my body under subjection. He said, I don't want to be what? A castaway. Paul did not want to be put on the shelf and not be used of God anymore. 
The Bible says we are salt and light. Amen. What happens to salt if it loses its flavor and its taste? You know what Jesus said in Matthew 5? Read that in verse 13 through 16. Now again, I want to say this for the third time. The judgment of God is just not always being turned over to the enemy. The judgment of God is being turned over to our own heart's desire and our own counsel. How many do we know today that walk in their own counsel? They work it out for themselves. They get in trouble or have problems. They work it out for themselves instead of relying on the presence of God Almighty. Now, I'm going to close here in this passage, and I'm going to give you about three or four other verses um, in relation to this. But notice, I'm going to read one verse. He says here in this passage, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 30, where there is no vision, the people want the next word. The people want perish. But he that keepeth the law, don't ever forget the rest of this verse. Many quote the first half of it. We had a man running for president some years ago, and he quoted part of this verse in his campaign. He never finished. The Bible talks about where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law happy. You know who it is that has vision? It's the individual that keeps God's law. They're the ones that has vision. Now, where there is no vision, the people perish when they rebel, hearken not to the Word of God. Let me give you some closing verses and then we'll be through this evening. In Exodus 33, verses 14 and 15, please jot these down. They'll be important to you later. We find there that Moses would not even move. He asked God to go with him. And he would not. God said, My presence will be with you. And Moses said, I won't go unless you are with me. He said, I, I won't go. He said, I won't go unless your presence is when God said, My presence will be with you as you go through this journey. In 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 6, after Saul had rebelled against God, he had rejected the Word of God. He had rejected the counsel of God. In 1 Samuel 28 and 6, the Bible says that God quit speaking to Saul, and if I can remember it correctly, it was through the Urim and Thummim. I believe that's in the passage. It was, he said that he quit speaking to him through the prophets, and he quit speaking to him uh, through dreams. These are ways that God spoke to people. So he quit speaking to Saul in a number of ways, and Saul ended up with his own heart's desire, in his own counsel, he went to a witch to get advice to find out whether he would win a battle or not. Then in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 20, the demise of Samson, the Bible says he knew or wist not that the Spirit had left him. He knew not when the Spirit of God had left him. This is why I say the average church today, they would not know if the Spirit of God packed his bags and closed the door and left. They would carry on with their programs and their plans, their devices, their counsels. They would carry right along for many years after that, never knowing that the Lord had left. Job was a man that had a vision. Paul was a man that had a vision. Jesus Christ in Hebrews 12, verses 1-5, through had a vision. He said as we close here, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Talking about the sin and the death, there was a man in Corinthians that had been fornicating, sinning in the church, the Apostle Paul says, turn his flesh over to destruction to Satan, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, he was a man that was to be given up by God unless he repented. Unless he repented. I believe it's very important this evening that we understand that God does give up nations. He does give up churches. And He does give up individuals and families that we realize that this evening.